If I told you right now to go and build me a backend API for a new project idea, what language would you choose? Probably something you're familiar with, but that could still get the job done, like Python, TypeScript, or Go, right? But now I need you to cache external API calls, maintain multiple caches, and manage a long running background process that reads and writes from these caches at regular intervals. Suddenly, you've added Redis to your stack, along with a background processing library. And some of you have already started thinking about microservices. I can tell. You're all done? Great. I have one final requirement. This API must never crash. Damn, time to rewrite it all in Rust, I guess. As with every problem in software, there is a better way, a way you can handle everything I've just mentioned with one tool. You've seen the title by now, so you already know I'm talking about Gleam, the type safe, simplicity first language, expertly baked for massive concurrency, high availability, and effortless scaling. If you're not already sold, give me a few minutes and I'll show you just why you should be writing your next API in Gleam. This is a Gleam REST API written using the WISP web framework for simulating Pokemon battles, and it has two endpoints. The first first endpoint, slash Pokemon, takes a Pokemon name and returns information on the Pokemon, such as its base stats and available moves. The second is slash battle, which takes the name of two Pokemon and simulates a battle between them. Okay, but I can do that in another language. What makes Gleam so special? Gleam has an incredible static type system. It's super simple, but it has proper sum types and no null values. In Gleam, errors are values that are generally propagated using the built-in result type. This makes code more verbose, but it keeps control flow visible and simplifies debugging. For example, here's the logic for the slash Pokemon route. First, we check if the Pokemon we're looking for is in the cache and return it if so. Otherwise, we make a request to the Poke API. The use syntax with result.try will return the result if there's an error, only assigning the Pokemon variable and executing the code below if the function call was successful. We do the same with the Pokemon's moves before creating our return type, adding the Pokemon to the cache and return the root handler simply calls this method, returning it as JSON if it was successful, otherwise returning an error response with our message. All of this code is very simple to read, very simple to write, and doesn't blow up in your face. The code for calling the Pokey API is also very simple. We use the Gleam HTTPC library to construct and make a request, and then handle both the request failing and non-200 error codes. Then, we use the Gleam JSON library to pass the result into the API Pokemon type. Since Gleam is statically typed, and doesn't support macros or reflection. We have to manage JSON decoding somewhat manually. The JSON decoder we saw earlier decodes a JSON string into Gleam's dynamic type. Dynamic contains data that we don't know the exact shape of, and we use decoders to turn it into something we can represent in the Gleam type system. In Gleam, a decoder is just a function that takes a dynamic type as input and returns a known type, usually in a result. While more verbose, this allows us to do some validation logic at decode time, rather than having to wait until later. For example, the Pokey API returns our Pokemon stats in the JSON JSON array that looks like this. This would not be particularly friendly for our users, so it'd be much better to combine this into a single object that contains one field for each of the six stats. Here's a custom decoder that creates an intermediate list of API stats objects containing the base stat and the name of the stat, and then includes that in another decoder to create our desired stats object. Finally, we use our stats decoder in the decoder for our API Pokemon, and we're all set. At this point, you might be wondering, Isaac, how did you become such a god tier programmer? It was all thanks to today's sponsor, Codecrafters. Codecrafters is an online learning platform for advanced software engineers. Their courses are all focused around building your own versions of real production grade software. Personally, I'm fascinated by the technologies behind databases, so I've been learning Rust by completing their Build Your Own SQLite course. Each is run in stages, but instead of being told which functions you need to write and exactly what to do, Codecrafters courses are more open and simply link to any relevant documentation for the tool you're building. You then just push your code to a special Git repo that runs some automated tests, unlocking the next stage if they pass. I love this approach because I'm not stuck using a crappy online editor. I can use my Vim, by the way, and I don't feel held back by the slow pace of lots of online programming courses and tutorials. They've even recently released a couple of courses on replicating Redis and SQLite in Gleam. If you're interested, you can sign up using my link, which is on screen and in the description, for 40% off your plan. And if that's still too much, see if you can have it paid from your company's training budget. Let's talk about concurrency. Since Gleam runs primarily on the Erlang Beam VM, concurrency acts slightly different to how it works in other languages. Instead of running every async function in a single process and switching between them using an event loop, concurrent tasks in Gleam each get their own process, which can be completely isolated from the main process. There are two basic ways to use concurrency in Gleam, tasks and actors. We'll cover actors slightly later, but tasks are essentially jobs that have a single purpose and run to completion. You can collect the results at the end of the task, but typically you won't interact with it while it runs. We use tasks for collecting all the moves for a particular Pokemon. The Pokey API only returns a 
subset of move information when requesting Pokemon info, so we have to call another endpoint to get stats like the move's power and accuracy. To do that, we map over the list of moves using the task.async function from the Gleam OTP library to create a new task for each move. This calls the getMove function, which is just an API call like we saw earlier, and returns a task handle. Then we call task.tryAwait on each handle, passing in a timeout value. If the task returns successfully within that timeout, task.tryAwait will bubble up the task's return value, wrapping it in a result. Then we have some error handling code that generates a tuple containing our moves and any errors that occurred. If we had any errors, we return the first one. Otherwise, we return all our moves. You can avoid all the error handling by using task.await instead of tryAwait, but then the host process will crash if the task process crashes. As you can see, this has all been incredibly easy and you can pass any function to a task. You don't have to mark it in advance using an async keyword. Thanks to this, you don't end up with function coloring in Gleam and you can write linear, synchronous code and easily parallelize later. It's also worth noting that you don't have to await the tasks immediately like we do here. You can just leave the task to run in the background and await the result when you need it, even in another function. But come on Isaac, you said we'd also be able to replace our Redis cache. It doesn't look like tasks are going to help us do that. Well, that's where actors come in. When you're writing an API in a language that uses async await or some other implementation of futures, your concurrent functions will generally run on a single process. This means if you create a lot of futures and one of them has an infinite loop of CPU bound code, it could block other futures from completing. This makes it very difficult to have long running background processes that can communicate with the main thread. In these cases, people will generally reach for either an external service like Redis or split up their monolith into microservices. The Beam gives us some other options instead. For something like a cache, you typically use an ETS or Erlang term storage table, which is a concurrent in-memory data store built right into the VM. However, the ETS API is a little more complicated and not quite suited for a beginner video like this one. So instead, we're going to make a trade-off and use actors. Actors are long-running processes that hold some state, and you can communicate with them by passing messages, which will be processed in a first-in, first-out order. This makes actors a great solution for keeping your apps race condition free, as only one message is processed at a time. So the underlying memory is not shared across processes. Unfortunately, actors can't process messages concurrently. So in a production use case, there'd be a bit of a bottleneck, but this is a silly little app for demonstration purposes. So let's take a look at how we can implement a cache using actors. I've created a couple of type aliases here to save my little fingers. A store, which is our underlying data storage for our cache, is just a dictionary with string keys. The cache type we'll be passing around in our app is really just a subject that takes a message. A subject can be thought of as an address for where you want your messages to end up. You don't need to worry too much about the implementation details for this video, but let me know in the comments if you'd like a deeper dive into Gleam concurrency. The last type we need to define is the type of the messages we'll pass to our actor. The set and shutdown messages can be thought of as one-way messages. They tell the actor to do something and don't require a return value. The get and get keys, on the other hand, take a subject in their constructor, which is generic across the return type of that particular message, and allow us to send data back to the original process. So, sending a get message will return a result containing either the value at that key or nil if it can't be found. Lastly, we create a handle message function that takes in our message and our store, doing some work before allowing the actor to continue with the updated store. For get and get keys messages, we use process.send to send the result back to our client. The shutdown message just stops the actor. Finally, finally, we create some functions to start a new actor using actor.start and to abstract away some message sending from the rest of the application. That seemed like a lot, but it was actually only 83 lines of code to allow us to create fully isolated caches in our app. We set up the caches in our main function and add them to a context type that gets passed into every request. Using the caches speeds up the app a lot and actually helps us stick to the Pokey API fair use policy. So it's a double win. Gleam and the Beam also have the concept of supervisors in concurrency, which are processes that look after other processes. But I'll talk about those in the aforementioned concurrency video. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss it. I also won't be going into the details of the Pokemon battle simulation in this video. It's very rudimentary and it's all fairly standard Gleam with nothing particularly noteworthy in Vault. If you want to take a look, the code is all on GitHub, and I'll probably also use this project as part of a full Wisp tutorial in the future. The slash battle endpoint simply returns the winner of the battle between two Pokemon, making sure to use the cache to avoid unnecessary calculations. That said, we do have one other long-running process to talk about, and that's the battle manager. Again, this isn't special. It's just a task that runs infinitely, calculating the results of the battles of every possible combination of Pokemon that we already have cached. I wouldn't recommend this for a production system, as the number of battles increases exponentially with each additional Pokemon, but it's a fun example for this video. And that's about it. As you can see, Gleam makes it really easy to write fault-tolerant, scalable APIs. The type system is a big highlight. It's robust enough to allow you to make invalid states unrepresentable, but it's simple enough to not be a nightmare to work with or refactor. What do you think? Do you think you'll adopt Gleam in your future projects? Let me know in the comments. And if you decide to start using Gleam in production, make sure to try out the Codecrafters Gleam courses to help you get there. Want a 
more basic intro to Gleam? Well, I just so happen to have a video made just for you, and you can find it right here.